Thank you, Sam. Danielle, I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Ed Jennings. As Sam mentioned, I've been the tax director here for over 25 years. And every once in a while, we come out and we get to give this presentation. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, we're going to talk a lot about taxes in general, uh, typically using taxation of scholarships and fellowships as a sort of example as we go throughout this. Um, we're going to it's, it's a very interesting uh, discussion and I think hopefully educational. And I think part of that is, is because we're going to talk about a, a tax burden that graduate students inherit as, as their role based on how the tax laws are written. In other words, uh, you have quite a quite a burden placed on you when it comes to doing your taxes. You have to identify your tax. You have to quantify your tax. You may have to pay them in quarterly. Uh, and you may have multiple uh, state tax uh, forms to file um, and uh, income tax forms. So as we go through this, I just want to, we want to talk a lot about that. And as Sam mentioned, if you have questions, feel free to raise them. Um, this is a PowerPoint presentation that you should have access to. Uh, this will be very handy. We have some case studies in here, so it should help you as we go through. Um, as a qualification, I have to let you know, as a tax director for the University of Michigan, I'm not allowed to actually give personal advice to individuals, uh, including President Ono, uh, for insurance and risk reasons. But I'm allowed to come out here today and talk about taxes that actually may affect your situation um, because this is an educational format. So for the next hour and a half, any and all questions you have that are your tax questions, that may be your personal tax questions, you are free to ask because that's going to be viewed as educational. But do know afterwards, I'm not going to be able to, or anyone on my team is going to be able to help you answer any of your questions. So I just want to let you know that. The good news is, again, you have access to this presentation. The, it is taped, so that'll help. Um, and there's, and we'll mention certain resources at the very back of the presentation. There are certain uh, IRS publications that you can refer to. Now, again, they're IRS publications, so keep in mind the IRS writes them for their, in their favor. Of course, you know, the IRS is another party to a court case, and that's how that works. And they write all these publications to be as helpful as they can, uh, as long as it helps them as well. So that's something to keep in mind, meaning there's other positions you may take that are different than what you're reading in the publications. But just the same, it's very helpful as a learning tool. Um, and then, you, of course, you've got master tax guide and things like that that you can find in the library and other things. And there's TurboTax and those kind of things you can use the software systems when you go to prepare your return. So there's a lot of help out there. Um, so uh, there's more access than just me. But just to say, during this next hour and a half, any questions you have, feel free. Um, so on that note, uh, one thing I do want to say, too, as we go through this, um, uh, and this is certain distinctions we need to make. When we talk about the tax burden, it's actually heaviest on certain students. And they would be U.S. citizens or resident aliens. This is all as defined by the code. Uh, whereas non-resident aliens, what we call NRAs, um, actually have a little bit easier. And we'll explain that as we go through. But just keep in mind, there is a distinction on how, how this works as we go. Uh, and the agenda that we're looking at here, just really some ge general basic questions that you're going to ask. So what's taxable income for federal tax purposes? And uh, that we're also going to have that question for state. And basically, they're identical. Um, how is how are taxes paid? How's this happen? I have taxable income. How's it get to the IRS? How's all this work? Um, and then how do I file my taxes? What what's my burden? What's my obligation? And then basically, do I have do I have to pay in payments quarterly? When when do I have to make the payments? So these are there's a, 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 a series of questions that you're going to want to ask. And then what about multiple? state tax returns. I mean, I'm not from Michigan originally. Do I have to be concerned? And and that's at the state level. And we'd have both a case study for Fed and state. So you'll see as we go through that, we try to simplify it as much as we can, but at the same time, try to get the essence of the issue. So if you have questions as we go through, feel free. Um, so now we're going to just look at some general concepts. And uh, um, the question is, what's taxable income? And Basically, there's certain series of principles that you abide by when you actually do taxes, and they're all here in the Internal Revenue Code, and many of them are right here on this page. Um, so the first thing is, what's the definition of taxpayer? And it's very broadly defined. Um, taxpayers are individuals, trusts, estates, corporations, exempt organizations. Yes, we even have income tax called unrelated business taxable income, which is really where we spend a lot of our time. Uh, and we have to pay taxes, and we're an exempt org. The definition of income is broadly defined. So it's really an accretion of wealth. Um, wages, interest, dividend income, cap gains. But keep in mind, they tax happiness if they could, if they could quantify it. So it is very broadly defined. Um, it's interesting 
We're going to be talking a lot about income taxes, but there's also another tax that's on your wage statements, uh, that's on, uh, it, it can be on your tax return, which is self-employment tax or FICA. Uh, and uh, FICA is really when you're employed, your employer has to has to collect FICA from you and pay FICA. They pay half your FICA. Uh, the FICA tax is 15.3% or self-employment, and the employer will pay half of it, but you have to pay it. Now, as a student, if you're a GSRA or something like that, uh, you may actually be excluded from FICA because there is an exception for students. But if you're working at Wendy's or something, it's not going to apply. So you may hear of FICA. We're really going to be talking a lot about income tax here. And particularly when we talk about fellowships and scholarships, we really don't see FICA much. But you should know enough about it because from time to time, the IRS will send out not IRS notices basically, uh, you know, uh, assessing you FICA taxes when they're when they don't apply. Um so that's that's the uh, that's the other tax regime, FICA. But you'll hear about it. It's in the background, but it's not the main player of this presentation. Um, now, the tax rates for Fed are on a graduated basis. Uh, when you look at state, when we get to multi-state, some are flat tax all the way through, like Michigan. Others are graduated like the Fed. When they're graduated, what it means is, is um, the more income you have, of course, the higher uh, uh, the more income you have, the higher the tax rate is. So the tax rate will be higher on that dollar. Uh, the same dollar you would you first made uh, would be much lower. So if I'm making ten thousand, you're making twenty thousand, your last dollar is going to be taxed at a higher tax rate than my dollar because I'm in a lower bracket. And that's the concept they always say: Oh, you bumped me into a higher tax bracket. The only time that's a problem is when they're taxing you over hundred percent. So that's not a bad thing. But you are going to pay more in taxes. You're going to have less earning power per dollar as you go from bracket and, and you increase and promote from bracket to bracket. Um, and then there are, uh, one question we get a lot is, so when do we file the tax return? What's it based on? Uh, well, for the U.S., it's actually typically the calendar year, January to December. And uh, um, it's on a, um, uh, uh, on a cash basis. So, um, you know, if you someone says they're going to pay you next next year, uh, and uh, they don't pay you until next year, it's not going to be taxed until next year. It's a cash basis. Next year would be from that January through February, uh, through December, excuse me. And uh, it's those 12 months. Um, and it's a bucket. So anything you get in January, June, and July all goes in the same bucket. If you get it from different sources, uh, um, it could be from Wendy's, it could be your scholarship, it could be uh, um, a raffle winning. It all goes into the same bucket. Sometimes it's treated a bit differently in that bucket, but it's all in the same bucket. Um, and you'll see an example on that, how it goes. Uh, something I do want to mention is uh, the this really is where the resident, non-resident alien distinction comes in. Um, the Internal Revenue Code subjects the taxpayer on its worldwide income. That would be the U.S. citizen and resident alien. Because you're deemed to be the resident alien is really a foreign-born person who's been here long enough to be considered to be a U.S. citizen. They don't have U.S. citizen rights or anything, but we'll tax you as if you do. And um, basically, um, uh, wherever you go in this world uh, and you make money, you will have to pay to the to the to the IRS. So you go over to Ireland. That was always an example we had in my day. And you sell paintings and art. They have a very low tax rate, 12 percent. Well, they're going to want to get their tax. You were in their country when you when you sold the money, when you sold the art. But then you get back to the U.S. and they're going to want to tax you on your art as well. And they will give you a credit to the extent that you paid the money to Ireland, but you're going to pay a tax. And the tax is usually higher than Ireland, which is why you went to Ireland in the first place. Um, you still have to pay the tax. So it's something to keep in mind. And this is a concept that's not just between the U.S. and foreign countries. It's, it's within the states themselves. And you'll see that with our example at the very end when we talk about multi-state. Um, Ed. Yes. For, for resident alien F1 students, does the education deduction, which is $1,000, still apply? Um, well, it, it depends uh, if they're if they're truly a non-resident alien, uh, they're going to be filing a 1040 NR and they get very few deductions. Uh, the good news is there is a software that International uh, Center has and it will it's for free and it will walk you through that. Now, the problem is, Sam, that question can be changed because if you're married, then you may be able to file uh, as a, uh, a um, on a on a 1040 as if you're a U.S. citizen. And then you could be able to get it. So there's 
many different ways to get that. Um, and it's a very difficult scenario. So you really have to know all the facts and circumstances. But I do know what you have is a free software that you can use at the International, uh, International Operations Center, and it will help you get through that. Um, and then lastly, uh, it's a pay-as-you-go. So if you earn if you earn the tax in, or, or you earn the income in February, you pay the tax in February. Yeah. And you see that a lot when you have um, uh, when payroll. Uh, anytime, every two weeks, they pay, make a payment to you or every month, if you're paid monthly or even weekly, you say, oh, I earned 300 bucks this week. And you turn around and go, but I'm only getting 200. Well, 100 has been taken out for taxes. And they take that out. They they take it out as you go. Um, so when you go to do your tax return, now, again, we talked January through um, December. And, and at the end of 2023, you have to file your taxes, April 24th. We don't pay your taxes April 24. You should have been paying your taxes all along through 23. In April 24, you reconcile. You just determine how much you you owe, how much you paid, and then you pay in the difference or the difference is refunded to you. So that's basically how it works. So it's a pay as you go. And that's very important because that's the concept when we talk about estimated tax payments. Um, a lot of times your employer is doing the withholding for you. So you're paying as you go, except you don't really notice it because your employer is doing it on your behalf. But if you turn around and you have, um, you have to do it um, where, and that's this burden that the U.S. citizens and permanent residents are picking up, then you have to do it. And when you have to do it, you're going to have a situation where you have to um, determine whether you have to make that payment. And if so, when. So, again, this is much more of a burden on students and than, than, than most taxpayers have. And interestingly enough, you haven't been a taxpayer very long. So. Um, no offense. So the idea is I find it interesting that they, they give you this burden. So at that, I'm going to stop and see if there's any questions, Sam, in general. Yeah, we've got a couple. Are certificate of deposits considered taxable income? So that's an investment. It's the interest on it. And they should give you a 1099 INT for interest. Um, but yeah, it'll be earning interest. That's the whole point of a CD. Um, you put it in a bank and you say, I promise I'll keep it there for two years or so. They get to take it and invest with it, which they really like. And in the meantime, they're going to pay you interest. That interest is an accretion of wealth. So yes, it's tax uh, and it's taxable income. For a FICA, thank you. For a FICA refund, do we request the University of Michigan payroll office? Well, that would be an interesting question. A FICA refund is your employee and you're basically saying, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have had this. I was a student. I should have been subject to it. I won't get it because I am subject to FICA. But if you feel you met the exception, always contact payroll. Uh, they need to know because the two of you are paying it in and you both need to coordinate your, 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 your actions. So, yeah, always reach out to payroll. OK, thank you. For an international grad student um, who up until August was a GSRA at the university at a university in Ohio, um, so they have documents in two states and at two different universities and they're not sure what to do. Well, that's our multi-state agency question. We'll get to that uh, at the back end of the presentation. Okay, thanks. And so does somebody get a tax treaty, for example, U.S.-China tax treaty? Um, if they can, what form would they need to fill out? Uh, well, I think a lot of that is when you come to treaties, treaties is something that uh, uh, you're really going to, it comes out to any kind of payment that is due you. Um, you're going to want to talk to payroll if it's something that goes on a 1042S or any kind of form that they're going to be issuing you. Um, and I say that because they, you have to get them to understand what you want them to do uh, so they don't have to withhold. Because sometimes the whole value of a treaty is it's saying, no, that isn't subject to tax. You don't need to withhold. And where there's the general law will say it is subject to tax. So the treaty overrides the general law. And you're going to have to convince payroll I'm I'm with this treaty and this treaty says this. Our payroll does not go by treaties. It goes by the general law, by the Internal Revenue Code. So you will need to say, if I have a treaty that says this is in my favor, you need to reach out to payroll. Okay, okay, thank you. And for NRAs, do things like referral bonuses on credit cards count as income? Well, uh, yeah, we'll talk some about this today too. Uh, that could be taxable income. It depends on the facts. Uh, but generally, yes, it sounds like it. And the question is, is it an accretion of wealth? Is it something you have now that you didn't have before? Um, mm. And yes. OK. But then the next question is, all right, then. So what happens? And you'll hear we talk a lot about reporting. So, you, people need to report things to you when they asked about the CD. It's the interest. 
Well, you're not going to know whether it's taxable or not, but they send a form to you, a 1099-INT, and that tells you, that identifies it for you. So uh, you tend you tend to want to get, you have to look for a form in the mail, uh, and that's usually going to tell you it's taxable income. Thanks, Ed. If someone did consulting for a non-U.S. government in last tax year, what kind of documentation do they need? It all depends. It depends whether you're a U.S. citizen or you're from that country and so on. But bottom line is um, that if someone's going to pay you something uh, as a consultant, they're going to ask for that documentation. They're probably going to give you what they're going to ask you uh, what they need. And then that's be able to meet their tax obligation. So the real question is, is if they if they're not sending it to me, do I still need to do something? And mm -hmm. that's really what it is. My sense is it's a lot of times it's best to call that company and ask. Um, uh, and say, listen, for the tax situation, how's this work out? And uh, in the U.S., they'd say, well, we'd give you a 1099 NEC and you should have gotten it at the end of January. And you say that's for the 23 year. And you'd say, oh, yeah, I got that. And that's fine. Yeah, they may say, no, we put you on a miscellaneous. Uh, we don't know why it doesn't sound like it. Um, and uh, you'll get that at the end of March. So anyway, the idea is uh, you always go back to the person who paid your money and ask if there's any are you if you if you're interested. Uh, are you going, am I getting a tax form? We get those questions here, so. Okay, and thank you, Ed. This will be the last one, y'all, because I know that Ed will be answering some of your questions um, in the rest of the presentation. How does reporting losses affect your taxable income? Reporting losses? Losses. Yeah, so one, you have to make sure they're, they're business losses. Uh, you can't say, oh, you know, I, I was um, lost my shirt. Uh, I'm going to take a loss of my tax return. It's not a business. Expense. So, um, but that's called, a, and there's a code section for it, 165. And if you read through it, it it'll tell you how it works. But basically, um, losses just go on your return under other income and you have to explain it. Do know uh, the explanation should be real detailed, real fact based, because the IRS is going to question anything and everything that's a loss. Um, the real question is if it's more than the rest of the income, is does it give me a now I have a negative? Um, what happens there and you get to carry forward. So we have, we've had businesses that have a loss at the end of the year and we call it a net operating loss and they carry it forward. So you want to make sure it's legitimate and they offset. And again, you're in a bucket. So it offsets everything else. So the interest from that CD will be offset by the loss. And if it's, if the loss is more, you now have a negative balance and you can only have zero in your return. So you carry forward the negative balance uh, to next year as a carry forward. Thank you. All right. So um, so now we're going to launch into some more details of a tax return to give you some comfort to it uh, and talk about various forms. Here is the the tax brackets we talked about and the graduated rates. And you can see at 10 percent, that's the lowest. That's where I would like to be. Uh, that's good from zero to 11. That's if you're single. Now, keep in mind, they have various statuses. You can be married and you can be married separately and you're treated like single or you're married jointly and basically everything's doubled. You can also be a head of a household, typically a single mom with kids, um, and they get a bit of a break uh, and understandable. And uh, that's the brackets. And again, you're if you're making a lot of money. This is really and this is net taxable income. That's after all the deductions. Uh, you're going to be hit at 37 percent. So um, that's how it works. Uh, and again, some states have a graduated bracket. So let's talk real quickly about scholarships, and fellowships. There's general rule. It's an accretion of wealth. So you would think it's taxable income. But there is an exception for qualified scholarships. So what's a qualified scholarship? Well, that's a payment, basically. And the, the definition is a candidate for a degree that's made for the purpose of conducting research at, edu at an educational institution. Um, that's here. That's you guys. That's not a problem. It's really a payment for your uh, tuition and anything that's considered to be part of uh, the tuition. An enrollment fee. Uh, it can even cons it reach out to... Um, material supplies and so forth that's required for the curriculum, not recommended, but required. Um, that's all going to be part of a qualified scholarship. And that is considered tax-free. It's it's not going to be considered taxable, does not go on the tax return. The non-qualified scholarship, and typically we see this in the form of cash. So you get a stipend and it's a check, you turn it to cash, and uh, it pays for your personal expenses. That's taxable income. Um, so uh, basically, if your tuition is waived, it's not going to be taxable income. But the $12,000 you receive every two months, 
and that's going to be taxable income. Unless you spend it for something like that's required part of the curriculum, certain books. So that's basically the concept. We'll talk some about that as we go through. Do keep in mind, we're talking income, and I'm looking at the bottom here, self-employment and FICA. That's not necessarily, scholarships is not considered to be, considered to be, sorry, earned income. Earned income is what's subject to FICA. That's what a wage is. What's what I'm doing right now? I'm earning my wage. But you folks on a scholarship, you're pursuing the, 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 the study of education and academics. And that's not considered to be earned. You're not doing that for an employer. You're doing that for the betterment of community, the betterment of, 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 of society. And for that reason, that's not going to be earned income. So just to let you know, parts of what you're receiving you're, and, and a good good way to look at this is a, someone in sports who gets a full ride. Um, they get the tuition waived and they get room and board. Room and board is taxable. Room and board is not the tuition. Room and board is not anything we said that's a required for enrollment or attendance at the class. It's not. It's not. It's not for study. It's not like a purchase of books. It's a room and board. That's actually taxable uh, taxable income. And they have to value what that is and put that on their tax return. And it, they get a stipend in addition to that. It's taxable. So the NIL, all these fees you hear about, it's all taxable income when they receive it. Um, how is the tax paid? Now, this is very interesting because this is this is how it this is the mechanism by which the IRS gets their money. Um, and it's usually through a form. And typically forms can be bad. You're like, oh my God, I got my tax form. It's gonna have terrible things to it. Not only that, they're whatever they're telling me, they told the IRS, all that's true. But the form is good in the sense. So you've got a W-2. Your employer will actually put the wages on the W-2, letting the employee know what the taxable wage is. You don't have to identify it. It's already there. Uh, also, as we mentioned, the employer will withhold every time they make a payment to you. And that withholding goes right to the IRS. That means your taxes have been paid on your behalf. That's great. Because that means all you have to do is file your 1040 form at the end of next April and uh, April 15th and shoot it in. But somebody's already done the payment for you. You're just looking to either make a smaller payment, whichever it didn't cover, or get a refund. That's the idea. A 1042S is a form that an employer files for that NRA. And on that form, uh, it's going to have on their taxable income, like the stipends, and they will withhold. Uh, and that's why NRAs will want to go to the International Operations Center to pull up that software, because in most cases, you're likely to get a refund. Um, payroll does a lot of this. So where I told you at the very beginning of this, I'm not allowed to answer questions. I'm not because I'm answering any kind of question you have on your personal tax advice. But I can tell you, if you have a W-2 or a 1042-S, that's a form that the university provided you. You have every right to call up payroll and say, what's this form? What's on it? How did I get it? Um, what's it mean? Uh, and they can tell you. And they should be able to answer all your questions. And again, that's going back to the question Sammy asked about China, the treaty. That's when you talk to your, your payroll. You call them up and say, on the 1042S, you're going to put something on there. I want to know um, if, if you're going to withhold. I think I'm ex excluded as a student under Article 14. And they say, oh, OK. So they were going to tax you. Now they won't. And then that means then you don't have to file a 1040NR. Um, and with the W-2, um, you know, the good idea is uh, if you're a GSRA, you got a W-2 because you're an employee for us. Then when you get a scholarship, you're not an employee. You're really working for yourself. And that's for your own study, your own growth. And that's why it's not subject to FICA because there's not earned income. So that's the idea. So the, the last form is a 1099. Now, they'll identify the amount for you, but they won't withhold. Um, and we tend to send this out to businesses. Uh, PwC is our auditors and they charge us for the audit report and we pay them money and we put it on a 1099 to tell the IRS, here's how much we paid them. So the IRS looks at their tax return and makes sure they're putting it on their tax return. Um, what's interesting is if you're a scholarship or fellowship, you're not going to receive any of these forms uh, if you are a U.S. citizen or resident alien. And, and th so there's no forms issued. No one's identifying for you what the tax is and no one's doing and withholding for you. So that's the burdens you're going to pick up. That's what we're going to talk about throughout the rest of the presentation. Um, if you're a non-resident alien, we, uh, the payroll office will issue you a form. So they will identify it and they will do withholdings. And you're, that's why the burden is not as great on NRAs, actually, for scholarships and fellowships. So that's the good news. Um, I don't have a lot of good news, so we should take a moment and 
appreciate it. Um, so now, very quickly, I just want to go through NRAs again, so you're very comfortable. Uh, a, a NRA, it's a non-U.S. citizen uh, who has yet to be here long enough to qualify as a resident alien. Um, to do that, you end up, uh, you know, there's a green card test, presence test, um, and it says here it can be overridden by the treaty, which usually happens. So many of our students, there are treaties, and the treaties do say you still re remain as a as a resident of China. You will not be a resident of the U.S. Um, or, or for five years, and your treaty is an NRA. Um, and of course, and Sam, this is one of the questions you asked earlier. By marriage, you can become uh, uh, into a, a and be treated as a U.S. citizen or a resident, a resident alien. So. But you're, as an NRA, you're only taxed on the U.S. sourced income. So the scholarship income you have here will be taxed. If you sold art in Ireland, that art, the proceeds you got from that sale of art will not be subject to the U.S. It's outside the jurisdiction. And because you're not a U.S. citizen, they can't tax you on your worldwide income. So it's only U.S. sourced income. Now, payroll, they can answer a lot of questions that you have if you're a non-resident alien and you get a 1042S. So do feel free to reach out to them. They're pretty good about it. They won't report and or nor tax your um, um, qualified scholarship, what we talked about earlier, but they will tax and withhold your non-qualified. And uh, but they can explain a lot of that. And if you feel they're taxing it when the treaty says otherwise, you need to reach out and talk to them. Um, and then here's where we've got some web addresses at the very bottom of this, the International Center. Very helpful. They have some very knowledgeable people on what the rules are. Uh, basically, as we mentioned, treaties help because they can reduce the income withholding or prevent it. Um, FICA doesn't really apply much, and you're going to find out why as you go through this. But uh, there's it's another it's another tax regime, and it doesn't come under the t income tax treaties. Um, and then there's the form you have to fill out. It's a 1040 NR. Uh, so we fill out a 1040. You get to fill out the 1040 NR. NR for non-resident. Um, and again, feel free to reach out to payroll and feel free to reach out to your national center. It's all very good. So now we're going to move into another topic. So uh, this is dealing with, we're going to get up to the 1098T. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, before we do, we have a quiz. And the quiz is, would you rather have a $50 deduction or a $15 credit? Um, and so the real question is, what's the difference between a deduction and a credit? And in the left-hand column, that's really how you fill out a tax return. Income. Then you have a deduction. Then you come up with your taxable income, do your tax. Then you apply any credits if you have it. And then here's what you owe. So in the middle column, we're looking at a deduction. There's your $50. So it's 100 less 50. Your taxable income is 50. Tax on 10% uh, on $50 is five. You have no credit, you owe $5. So basically with a $50 deduction, you got it all the way down to $5 of tax. Now with a credit, you don't have a deduction. So you have taxable income hundred dollars but at ten percent that leaves you with ten dollars and if you have a fifteen dollar credit that the credit is greater than the tax you don't owe anything so i'd rather have a credit than it, a five dollar fifteen dollar credit is more powerful than a fifty dollar deduction and in this case if it's refundable you get five bucks back so i know that's exciting but that's how i look at it um there we are sorry so that's how that works that's important because now we're looking at 1098t and they provide a deduction or credits. Most people like them for credits. Um, this is a form that's a good news form. We talked about the W-2 and the 1099 and so forth. They're not good forms. They're telling you all about the tax you owe and so forth. This tells you about a possible tax credit. People like this form. You should look forward to this form. There's two types of credits. There's the American Opportunity Credit, which is refundable, and the Lifetime Learning Credit, which is non-refundable. Not as good, but still good. Um, most graduate students qualify, well, very few graduate students qualify for the AOC, the American Opportunity Credit. Some of you may qualify for the Lifetime Learning Credit, but it's interesting. I'll, I'll walk you through that in a minute. Um, and again, the 1098T is a form. If you have questions on the form, you can reach out to Student Financial Services. They will be more than willing to answer any questions that you have. So to claim the AOC, um, basically, um, there are certain restrictions to it all throughout. I have to answer all these questions. And there's one down here that usually catches us. And this is the same question we're going to see in the lifetime learning credit. But were the same expenses paid entirely with a tax-free scholarship, grant, or employer education assistance? And it's really the first pieces that count to you guys. But to the extent you get a fellowship or scholarship for your entire tuition, you don't have anything uh, to take a credit on. 
Um, it's not anything that you paid for out of pocket. Someone else paid for it. And uh, it comes over here where you can't take the credit. And that applies here as well. Now, I know this says for the 23 year, they have yet to come out with the 24 publication. So we're, it, it'll say the same. Trust me, it said that for the last many years. So. Okay. I've got a couple of questions. All right. So if somebody has an official statement of charitable cash donation, is that taxable income? Well, if you made a, a cash donations, um, that sounds like something charitable. You made a charitable deduction. You gave your money away to a charity. You can get a deduction for that on your tax return. Um, but it's not income. It comes out of income. It reduces your income. It's a deduction to income. Okay, thanks. If scholarships exceed the cost of tuition slash fees, are refunds considered non-qualified? Okay, that's a great question. So let's look at this piece. This is the form 1098T you get. And in box one, it says just what you said, Sam. What's your tuition? It says 10,000. I'm making these numbers up. Then you get the box five. That's scholarships or grants. That's what we call a contra account. That goes, that has to be, that reduces what's in box one. So if you have 10,000 in box one and 15,000 in box two, not only does it completely reduce it, but there's $5,000 extra. And yeah, if I were the IRS, I'd realize that means that your tuition was obviously $10,000. The extra $5,000 was a, a stipend that you received. It had to be something. But what you put in box one is only the qualified scholarship amount. So that's what the tuition is, the qualified scholarship. And that's all you can put in box one is tuition. So anything in excess on box five over box one, that will basically indicate that. Now, the problem is the IRS hasn't had the system hooked up to be able to identify that as taxable income. I just mentioned it is. You now know it is. But let's put it this way. The IRS, if they know it, they're not acting on it. So just the same. But that is a mathematical way to do it. Other than that, there's no other form we give you that tells you what your taxable income is. And remember, some of the amount in box five that's in excess of one could be expenses for uh, items related to the curriculum, which are deductible. So it doesn't mean it's taxable. It just means it's in excess of tuition. But uh, you'd have to figure that out. But yeah, that's, that is a way to go. So I don't know if that, I use this form to answer that question, but basically this form is something that, uh, that our office, the University of Michigan Student Services, will send out to just about every student who basically has tuition. And you have your own uh, student account. And a lot of what goes into box one is your tuition itself. And then box five is your scholarship. And oftentimes, for students who have fellowship and scholarships, five can be greater than one. Yes, that can happen. And that usually means that, uh, you know, you, you have to account for, you had some some stipends money laying around that you used for something. If you used it for books required for the curriculum, it's not taxable. But if you used it for rent, it could be taxable income. Um, we then take that form and you put it onto this form. If you're going to take it on your tax term, now, again, most of, if you have a full scholarship, you probably won't be able to do this. But for some students, you might be able to uh, take this. For instance, you got your scholarship in September, but back uh, last in 23, uh, last winter, uh, you paid for an education at, uh, you know, um, uh, Florida State University um, and you paid the tuition. If you paid the tuition, you're going to get a 1098T from Florida State. And if one is going to be at 10,000, whatever it is and five is zero, you're going to be able to take, put $10,000 on this and see how much of it you get. And again, it's based on your individual tax situation. The wealthier you are, the less likely you're going to get it. And that's how it works. So, but that's what the credits are about. I bring this up because everybody gets this form and we get confused. It's not meant to confuse you. It's not an income form. And you're, and we really don't give a form for your uh, scholarship or fellowship. This is uh, just um, the back door and it's not really a reliable form. And the IRS doesn't rely on it, let's put it that way. Um, but uh, I did want to just bring it up so you're comfortable with how that works and make a distinction. It is a credit, and we'll talk about credits as we go. That's the good news. But only if you're entitled to it. And if you got a full scholarship, you're not going to be, uh, at least for our tuition. So that'll be an issue. So I'm going to stop there, Sam. Any questions? Yes. So a student has had two of their paychecks show 
M-E-D slash E-E and O-A-S-D-I slash E-E. While the, all of the, the others have shown only Fed and Michigan withholding. They have been a GSRA and a GSI during this time. They don't know why this is. You know, it's a great question. I don't know the details. I do know payroll will answer the question. Um, okay. Yeah, they'll be very helpful. Uh, and they're um, they're very good. And I've worked with them for, well, they won't admit it, but for many, many years. So, Thank you. So reimbursements for conference and travel or mm-hmm. conference travel um, are paid with fellowships and grant funds. Um, and folks have heard that this is considered taxable income. Does the IRS consider it such? So, because they technically didn't make the money. Yeah, well, that's, uh, you know, I I get that. Um, but um, let me walk through a scenario and, you know, come up with it. So you have to travel. You're going to do a study on the uh, koala bear. You know, obviously, you got to go to Australia. Uh, that sounds like it's an expense part of the curriculum. Um, that's what you need to do. You talk to your faculty and you get them to say it's part of the curriculum. It's required. It's required that you be in Australia. Heck, yeah, you're going to do a study on koala bear than that. I could, I could just sit here in the library and do it. I want you to go to Australia and I want you, that makes it required. That would then be a qualified scholarship or fall under the definition of qualified scholarship and not be taxed. You don't have to report that on tax return. If your faculty member says, uh, I want you to study up on some technology, uh, and I'm looking at my cell phone and you say, great. And you take a trip to Australia. That's a personal trip. That's going to be, that's how you chose to spend your money. In other words, the scholarship coming out is going to be taxable. And then if you say, but it's qualified, then it won't be. But if it doesn't meet the definition of qualified, it'll be taxable. Uh, and so qualified is it's got to be part of the curriculum. That's how you got to look at it. Okay, thank you. All right. Some, Go ahead. I'm some, sorry. If someone's both on fellowship and they need a refund, but also working as a GSA, GSI, and they need to pay, is there a subtraction that Glacier app does between both? So uh, I'll answer it briefly and then say, we'll talk about it when we get to fully estimated tax payments. So definitely bring it back up again. But okay. what happens is everything's in a book. Everything's in a bucket. And if you're a GSRA, you know, that money gets thrown into a bucket. And remember now it's on a W-2. So they've been withholding on that. And uh, if they're withholding at 20%, your tax rate's at 20, 10%, they're over withholding. And you go, wow, I don't want to owe, over withholding. What does that mean? That just means you're going to get a very large refund at the end of next April. And if you say, well, wait a minute, in the meantime, I got a scholarship and nobody did any withholding on that. And I'm subject to that at 10%. And we look at the numbers and we go, isn't that interesting? If I add them both together, I add up the tax and then I take the amount they withheld, it covers the tax. Then it does, there is a sort of combining and emerging and then they all come together. So you throw it all together into one big box or bucket and come up with a calculation. And then you determine because if they they withheld, they could over withhold. They they took too much, but then at the same time, you don't you no one withheld on this one, and you owe tax here. So you just pour this into that and cover it. Um, it can happen too with a spouse while you're getting scholarship and that tax is increasing and nobody's paying your tax. Well, if your spouse is making money and they're over withholding, that extra tax covers the tax you should, or you should have been paying. So you're good. So that's how it works. Okay, thanks. And I know you'll be answering some of these questions as we go along. Okay. So now we're up to uh, probably one of my uh, more realistic cartoons. Um, But anyway, um, audits aren't that bad, by the way. So here's the best part. So now you're single and you say, I got to, I get a, I've done the qualified, non-qualified, and I got a certain amount of non-qualified, $30,000 or something. That's all taxable income. Oh my God, at 10%, that's $3,000. Well, that's the gross income. And again, Sam mentioned interest on CDs and other things. You throw it all in and you check and see what your number is. But then you get some deductions. We talked about the $100 deduction. Let's talk about specific deductions. There's a standard deduction you get for just breathing. 
So if you are single, you get $13,850 for the 2023 year. And you can see it goes up if you're married and certainly if you're head of household. That's the amount you get. So that's a deduction that you get right away. Um, and that will apply for most students. Um, we're going to talk about this just because it, people talk about it. But again, this is somewhat not very relevant at all recently after they pass the Tax Cuts Jobs Act. But you do need to know whether you are a dependent or not. Um, and it'll come up from time to time. Your parents, uh, who would be the people to claim you as a dependent, would like it because there is a credit they get. But you guys are older. They wouldn't be entitled to it. So it's not something uh, your parents are not going to want to claim you as a dependent. Um, and they don't call it independent, by the way. They just call it not dependent. So um, but in most of the what we've seen, the grad students, they, they don't they don't, won't meet the dependency tests. You either have to be a qualifying child, which in many cases you may meet, but if you're uh, over the, if you're 24 uh, or more uh, at any time during the year, you're not going to be a dependent qualifying child. And you won't be a qualifying relative if you're earning more than $4,700 and that's gross income. So that can include your quality, your non-qualified scholarships. And that's a, in one of the cases. So you're probably not going to be a dependent. I mention it because it still plays into state taxes and you'll hear it from time to time on certain tax benefits you get at the Fed level. Um, so now we're into case study. So there's some of the grammar rules. And now we're into applying, uh, we're into the more fun part of case studies. We have a grad student who's single receives $14,250 of cash uh, in 23. Uh, they're a U.S. citizen, which we've talked about. And this person's 23 years of age, works solely and has nothing, no other income to declare but for the scholarship money of fourteen thousand two fifty, and so what's it look like? Well, here's what a return looks like: ten forty. Uh, you fill out all your names. There's social security number. Single, married. That's very important because that determines your tax rate. Um, then it gets down here. What's your standard deduction? You can either be a dependent, or uh, your spouse is a dependent, or uh, someone can claim you, and so forth. Uh, a lot of people. I you can leave this blank as well. Um, the thing is, if you're a dependent or not a dependent, the calculation on this case study is the very same. So I just want to let you know. Um, it's 14250. You put it on line one, by the way, with the W-2. Uh, it tells you to add it together. You take the 13850, you have four hundred dollars worth of taxable income. That's it. You had 14250, you get to subtract 13850, and you have just nothing but four hundred. And when you look at that at 10%, that comes up to uh, $41. And now you think, oh, you said I have to pay this in. Well, and we'll talk about it, but if it's $1,000 or less, you don't have to do a, a quarterly estimated tax payment. You can actually wait until next April. The IRS is not excited about $41. What they do is when they get your money, they invest it and they earn interest. And um, that's why you have to pay in as you go. They don't want to don't they don't want you to wait. You're costing them interest. Well, let's just put it this way. If you, you know, forty one dollars, it's worth more. It costs more on administrative effort than it, it is any interest they're going to earn. on that. So you can keep your money at least until April 15th. Isn't that nice of them? So anyway, that's that. Now, Sam, got a question? Yes. Yeah, speaking of paying as we go, is are there penalties for not doing so? If let's say you are partially paid as a GSRA and taxes are withheld, but then you were partially paid via a fellowship. So taxes were not withheld and, yep. but you didn't pay your quarterly taxes and you end up owing more taxes than what were withheld. So um, you're allowed to actually go into the April 15th next year period, that reconciliation period, and basically owe about 10%. As long as you paid in 90% during the, the calendar year 23, when you go to do your taxes for 23, April 15th, and you sit down and look at it, as long as you paid in 90%, you're probably not going to get hit with an underpayment penalty. Um, and we'll talk about this when we get to the quarterlies. But if you, uh, everything the IRS does is their poor parent management skills, they penalize everything. So if it's beyond the 10% and you are, uh, you only withheld 80%, then yeah, there'll be a, there'll be a penalty and they will be, and we can talk more about that when we get to the estimated. But yes, yes, you have to worry about that. And that's that is how they incentivize people with pain. So tell us. Um, 
I'm the son and grandson of dentists, so I naturally, you know, tax is intuitive to me. But uh, uh, it just makes sense. Um, now, here's, uh, oh, I'm sorry, another case study. I guess we should read it first. We have a postdoc student. They have a grant award of $15,000 to conduct research at University of Y. And it's just a cash stipend. Then we have a, and a person's a U.S. citizen. The expenses are primarily for rent and other living expenses. Alternatively, same facts, but the grad student receives a grant award of $25,000. They take 9000 of it and they pay tuition. They have 1000 they spend on books. And then the rest, the fifteen, is for rent and other living expenses. So basically, you're looking at 25 less 9 less 1 is 15. That's what you have left over. Now, this is very interesting. So how does it look on the tax return? Um uh, now, that's not actually how we do it at the university. We wouldn't give you the 25. We would probably just give you a 10 and you'd spend the one and then you'd have the, the nine left over. Or, or you, we'd take the nine for tuition and we would give you the uh, um, the rest. And then you'd spend it and you'd spend a thousand for b books and so forth and then 15 for rental. So that's basically how it would work. But uh, you report it the same. It's both $15,000. So the 15 goes on line one, not a problem. Here, it's the 15 that goes on. You do this math on your own. You don't include it on the tax return. They don't want to see it. Keep it in your records. And when they come to audit you, if they do, you're going to need that because you want to prove that. By the way, they don't audit you like tomorrow. They audit you like two years and 360 days later, just before the statute limitations goes by. So you want to make sure you have documentation. That documentation is important because if I, if you're Students, the way I knew students in my day, you guys are moving around a lot. And if you're moving around a lot, you're always you know, losing things. The easiest thing to lose is your tax documentation. So put it in a special box so you have it. You're good. Put it in a special file, whatever it is, and you're okay. Um, but when you go to report on a return, all the IRS wants to know is what's your taxable income? If we don't like it or we don't agree or we don't believe you, we will come to you and find out. So that's basically how it works. Just pay us what you owe. 15 less the three, 13, 850, which we talked about earlier, puts you in the situation of, oh, I'm sorry, taxable income of 1,150. And uh, that comes out to $114, $115. Again, not too bad. It's under the thousand. So to go back to that estimated tax payment question, I, I wouldn't have to pay this in in the 23 year, Sam. I could wait until April 15th of 24 and then pay it because it's under $1,000 with no penalties because I'm too small. They don't care about me, which is fine. I kind of being uh, anonymous with the IRS is a good thing. So that's how it works. So that's the estimated tax payments. Um, or I'm sorry, that's the overall, that's how the we're moving to estimated tax payments. That's the overall calculation on a tax return. And that's the two case studies. Again, it really doesn't matter if you're independent or not. And uh, it really doesn't matter uh, how your accounting works. Uh, it's really what they want on your return. You keep the accounting on your own. And if they come to you, then you'll need it. But that's that. And uh, they can, they may come to you. I doubt it. Uh, they would come to us. The only chance is you're doubled up. Your chances of being auditors double because they can come to us and ask us uh, what you've been doing. And part of why we do this presentation is tell the IRS, we, we talk to our students about this. They know about the rules. And they feel better about it. So, uh, and it's my job to convince them to not come after you folks. That's my job. And uh, um, we'll see what happens. So far, they have been in and so far they've asked. And so far, they have not gone after any of our students. So, so the presentation must be boring enough. But anyway, it seems to be working. So now, oh, I'm sorry. I got the joke here. I want to show that. Uh, um, the jokes are very important. Uh, when my kids were young and they were bad, uh, my wife and I would uh, make them read my outlines. And uh we, they're very good kids to this day. So I just want you to know, it's a great parenting tool. Um, and uh, uh, the jokes, uh, my one son, she, you know, you know, these jokes, they're not, they're not funny. I go, oh, no. In fact, they get worse as you go. So and, and it's the presentation. It's not the joke. I could put the funniest joke at the end. It's still not funny. So I just want you to know uh, that's how it works. The nature of jokes and tax humor. Um, if you have to do estimated taxes, now you have to sit down. And that's some of the questions we had earlier. I'm a GSRA. I earn $10,000. I have a scholarship and they gave me cash stipends, which I didn't use for any of the curriculum or anything. It's $10,000. I have $20,000 worth of tax. Well, we know the 
flat rate is uh, 10% up to 11,000. And then at 9,000, it's a 12%. So somewhere in there, you're going to be just under 12% tax on $20,000. I got to pay that in. Okay. But remember now, you got that standard deduction of 13,850. That's not so bad. So that brings you down. So now you start doing the math and you go, all right, do I owe anything? Well, what did you withhold? A lot of times the withholding covers whatever you owe in total. And that's what you want to look at. And again, that can be from you having another job. It could be you from having a spouse who works and, and collects. So there's all kinds of ways to have it. But that's the estimated tax payments. Now, if you the, the, the calculation or the computation I just went through, that's this. There's a worksheet. Uh, we have publications at the very end of the uh, uh, outline. And uh, one of those publications is estimated taxes. And there's a worksheet in that. And this is the one for your 2024 year. Uh, if you say you think you're going to make 28,600, you, you just know what the number is. Now, it could be 20,000 in scholarships and 8,000 in cap gain and 600 in interest, whatever you think you're going to have, you toss it in there. You get your um, deduction. Now, next year, it'll be 14,600. It increases. So you're talking at about uh, 14,600, uh, uh, which leaves you with $14,000 worth of taxable income. That's not bad. You know, just under 30, and you're now down just, at just under 15. You take your tax rate on it, and it's more than 10% because we talked about how that, that you're single here. So anything over 11,000 is going to be at a higher rate than 10%. But it's 1448. And Sam, we talked about 30, uh, 90%. There it is, uh, line 12A. You just have to pay in 1303, 1303 for the current year during the current year. And the difference you can pay in later on April 15th. And if you break it down by quarter, it's 326. Now, that would mean that you got the amounts paid ratably. A lot of times we get them paid twice a year. So you're really doing two payments, right? You know, and, and, and the dates, we talked about the dates, sorry. Um, you, you could get paid in uh, July 1st. Well, that would probably be a September 15th calculation. And if you got July 1st and December 31st, the next one could be a January 15th. So it all depends where you want to make your payment and how you want to do that. But Bottom line is, um, that's how this works. Uh, you also have uh, state taxes, and they have estimated taxes as well. But um, it's the Fed government that you'll get notices from. It's the Fed. The Fed government works pretty hard on making sure you're paying in your uh, taxes rapidly. And keep in mind, it's real simple. Because if you get back to the end of the year and you owe fourteen hundred dollars and fourteen forty eight, and you didn't pay anything, it's very simple. Uh, they know they know it's in excess of a thousand dollars, and they just pull up the four hundred and forty eight and they say it's taxable. It's very simple. So that's how it works. So that's your that is your situation. Here's what here's how it looks like when you're going to make the payments. You can do it electronically now. It's very much the same, but you got to put all your information on there, and then you send it in. Uh, the IRS is good enough to make sure. By the way, they're really super service friendly when it comes to making sure you have to make your payments. So here you are. Um, that when you're going to make payments to them, um, they give you a little worksheet you can fill out and go through it and put everything in on it you need. So you can, you know, go out that night, enjoy yourself, come in the next day and go, oh yeah, I, I remember now I got to make that payment and you're good. That's how it works. So quarterly estimated tax payments is the concept is you need to pay it during the year, pay as you go and you need to calculate it. It's not that bad. Once you do some high level stuff, um, I like this worksheet. It does a nice job of uh, being able to explain what it is. But some people like to go back and just fill out the old tax return itself and see what comes up each quarter. You can do that. And then you divide it by four. However you want to do it, it's up to you. Um, uh, do keep in mind, whatever you put in, have already paid, that's a credit. That's a credit to you. It's, a with, it's as if it's been withheld on. It's already a payment. So you're good. So, uh, Sam, at this point, uh, let me just do penalties and then I'll turn it over. So, again, we mentioned penalties, and that's what this is saying. Everything's done by penalties. You pay it at least 90%, you're okay. You can pay in 100% of last year, but a lot of times with students, it's the same or it might be more. So, that's not necessarily going to necessarily help. Um, and you basically want to make sure that you view it on an annualized basis. That's really what you want to do. So, you get paid 300 grand. Uh, I'm sorry, thirty thousand dollars. Thirty grand, goodness. Uh, thirty thousand dollars in uh, January, and then you don't get anything for the rest of the year. Then you just want to annualize that throughout the year, uh, and so forth. 
And then the exception, again, we mentioned that's that thousand dollars. That's really helpful. So now at that point, we're going to get into some of the uh, multi-state issues, which really can be a full half hour. So I want to turn it back to you, Sam, for any kind of questions anyone has. Yes, thank you. So somebody asked regarding paying quarterly taxes, if how much you made and how much you paid in taxes the previous year, does that, is that related to it? Yeah, actually there's, um, when you go to do it and you go this year, I owe, $20,000. Uh, $2, and last year, I only owed $1,500. When I go to do my correlation made tax payments for this year, I only have to pay in 100% of last year's. I only have to pay in $1,500. Whereas if I took the 90% of $2,000, I have to pay in $1,800. So I'm saving myself $300 up until April 15th of next year. You know, I still have to pay in the $2,000, but it's when you have to pay it in. So how much do I have to pay in during the year and how much can I hold? and wait until April 15th of the next year. Uh, it's a real tax planning tool for certain people. And I'll give you a quick story. Um, there was a guy who was a, a programmer and it was in um, military munitions. And uh, there was a war at the time going on. Uh, and uh, this guy's salary was about $200,000 a year. He's a pretty good guy. Then he made this thing and uh, the government bought it. And he made uh, about $150 million, I think in one year. So he went from two hundred thousand dollars to one hundred fifty million. It's a lot of money, and uh, and that year, all we had him do was pay in what he paid in the year before, Sam. So he didn't have to pay in any more yet. So all that extra money he should have been paying in, if you went by the ninety percent rule, he didn't have to pay in, and he got to earn a lot of interest on it. So, uh, so it worked out real well. That is a good example. But what you do is you invest that money and so forth. You hang on it. Um, with students, it doesn't tend to work because our, our salary or our income doesn't jump that much from year to year, you know, that kind of thing. So last year is pretty much this year's. So it, it's almost better to use this year because you only have to do 90 percent of this year. We, if you're going to rely on last year's exception, you have to pay in 100 percent. Do you know what I mean? That kind of thing. That may be more than 90 percent of this year. That's the idea. Gotcha. And if you're paying quarterly, do you have to file something or can you just pay? Yeah, the problem is you don't ever want to just pay, uh, particularly the government, because they just take. So mm -hmm. you want to have a receipt, and that's what this is. So you fill this out, and you send it in, you send it on paper. If you do electronically, keep a copy. I will tell you, many times, they will never question what your W-2 is. Here's your income. We got that. We don't see any withholdings. You go, I paid in quarterly estimated tax payments. Sorry, we don't see it. And you go, here it is. And they go, oh, that. Yes, yes, yes. So it's one of those. I'm not kidding you. It's very frustrating. You definitely want to keep any receipt. Returned receipts is very important, too, if you feel you're going to have trouble. So a lot of people, you know, they do their taxes in January, so you're not so worried. But some people do it like April 14th. If you're going to wait that late and you owe money, you're going to want to do return receipt mailings just to prove it is. So anyway, there's a lot There's a lot there. So that's a lot of good questions. But um, that's the receipt. That's what you need. Go ahead, um, Sam. I'm sorry. Oh, no. You're great. Sorry. Just dusting my back. Um, someone asked, can you write off the interest on prior student loans? Um, you can get, uh, there's a certain rule on student loans and they taken away a lot of it. Um, it's also an itemized deduction. We didn't talk about itemized deductions, but you know, you get a standard deduction, the 13,850. Well, you know, if you actually have a house and mortgage interest and so forth and so on, and it's high enough, you can do itemized deductions, which is greater if it's greater than thirteen eight fifty, um, but if it's not, you won't you won't be able to take the the deduction. You won't want to take the deduction. You'll want to take the larger, which is the standard, rather than the itemized. So, for instance, uh, you know I'm older now, more in my sed sedentary years. So my wife and I, we've actually paid for the house, so we don't have much mortgage, but we have real estate property taxes we have to pay, and we have other kind of bills and so forth that you can get on itemized expenses. But it doesn't come anywhere near the thirteen thousand eight fifty. And being married jointly, you know, at twenty six thousand, I'm I'm fine. You know, twenty seven thousand dollars. That's a lot of money, Sam. You know that kind of thing that you could get as itemized expenses. So I take we take the standard deduction because it's so high. Um, so you have to ask yourself the question: Would I rather do itemized or or standard? If the standard's higher, forget the itemized. And what you just mentioned, the interest deduction for students' loans, that's an itemized expense. So um, you may be incurring it, but you won't. You won't want to take deduction because you'll you'll want what's best for you. So. 
Gotcha. Aaron has a question. All right, Aaron. Aaron yes. Neal? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I'm, I'm right here. So basically when I started school here, I didn't realize I had to do quarterly payments. So what do you mean by the 100% thing and like how screwed am I? Ah, so uh, it depends when your first payment was. Um, if it was September 1st, that would fall into the January 15th payment, the January 15th lateness, um, as soon as you, know, you just make the payment as soon as you can, that's how you undo it. Cause it, it ticks for every day that it's late. So the less days, the better. Um, and if it's the September 1st, heck, you can go all the way to, um, January 15th. And that's when they would expect that. That's when the clock will start ticking for the, for the, for the lateness. And then it's between January 15th and now you're only you're, within two months, you get your return in, then you're only going to have be charged, uh, the, the underreported penalty of for two months. You've minimized it. Okay, I, I still don't understand what you mean by a hundred percent of the prior year. Okay. So so that's that's the that's the, the the how the penalty works, which is on a lateness. So if you've got uh for 23, you look at your tax liability, and if you say, oh my goodness, it's it's uh, I owe, I owe $2,500 and you could look at last year's and it was just a thousand dollars, well, $1,500. Then all you have to pay in for the 23 year was 1500. It's a hundred percent. Whereas you could pay in 90% of the current year, which was 2,500. Uh, and you could do 90% of that or a hundred percent of the 1500 from the prior year. That's how that works Aaron. So basically, assuming I file my 2023 return on time by April 15th, then there shouldn't be a penalty. Well, well, uh, you, you file it. Is there going to be a gap? Are you going to pay anything? I presume so, because taxes were not withheld for fellowship students. OK, so if so, if Scott, if, well, but it depends if you have other withholdings that can cover the amount of the scholarship. Because it's all one bucket, Aaron. And if you've got it where well, you can cover it, then you should be okay. So it all depends how much you, how much withholding. If you've had another, we were GSRA or anything else during the year. Uh, yes, I was at another place before that did withhold taxes, but I'm not sure, you know, if that's going to cover, you know, the taxes, the taxes I owe on my scholarship. Good. Well, this is a good point. So there's a couple things. If the amount they withheld for the 23 year is equal to or greater than what you owed 100 percent of in the 22 year, then they, they covered your prior year because you can make it under two ways. Either your 100 percent of prior year was covered or 90 percent of the current year was covered. And those withholdings could do one or the other. So you have to go back and check out how much withholdings are. Go back and check what your tax liability was for 22. And if the withholdings for 23 are greater than the tax liability for 22, you shouldn't have a penalty. If the tax liability for 23, if you take 90% of the tax liability and it's less than the withholdings that they did for the 23 year, you're not going to have a tax liability or a tax penalty. Sorry. Um, so you won't have an underpayment penalty. So it depends. Uh, it depends how much those withholdings are. But they, believe it or not, a lot of times when you fill out your W-4, if you put zero in as your number, that means there's the least amount of withholdings, which means they're going to take the most out that they can. That actually can be a lot of money and be very helpful to you. Thank you, Ed. Sianyi, can you let us know your question? Yeah. So my question is, um, as uh, as I think most audience are, we are either GSI or GSRAs uh, receiving payment from the school, the stipend from the school. Do we need to do this uh, quarterly uh, tax reporting or can we wait until like every year? So, again, uh, that's a great question. And I think it would it, it looks like if the if you're a GSRI or GSRA, the University of Michigan is withholding tax on your behalf. And if you call a payroll and ask how much your withholding is to date, 
they'll tell you what that is. And that means that tax is being paid on your behalf. How much that tax can cover on your taxable income, because really it's meant to cover a lot of what you're making as a GSRA. Um, you can overwithhold, you can ask them to overwithhold, and that will cover some of the scholarships. But in general, you might have to still come up with some money to cover the scholarships because what they're withholding is only going to be tied really to what they consider to be taxable. So. All right. I see. And, and the scholarships towards, for instance, like tuition waived, is that what you mean by the scholarships that they would consider taxable, even though you are a GSA and are receiving like a W-2? Yeah. So if you're a GSRA, your tuition is waived, not taxed, but we're paying you wages for being a GSRA. Those wages, just like they're paying me, is going to be subject to taxable income. Uh, I don't think they're going to be subject to FICA, but they'll be subject to taxable income. And for that reason, Sam, they withhold. And that's the good news. You got something's been withheld on your behalf. And the more that the employer withholds, the less you have to make of a quarterly estimated tax payment on your scholarship. Okay, thank you. Xiaoming, this will be the last question, Yang, because we want to make sure we get everything from Ed. Uh, I just want to ask if we do own penalty because we didn't uh, withhold or repay estimated taxes. How does that work? Yeah. So, uh, so one, you, you have to check and see if you paid enough in. Um, and we were talking about how that can happen in many different ways. But if not, um, there's a a penalty, a, a statement that you're going to your software will probably want you to uh, complete, which is a twenty two ten form twenty two ten, and it'll compute the underpayment penalty. That form is probably more difficult than any, the rest of the tax return. I just want you to know. So, and that'll certainly be punishment enough to make sure you never fall into an underpayment penalty situation again. Um, but it's on the thing. The software can help you do it. Um, if the IRS assesses it, if you don't do it, the IRS will assess it, but they take the worst case scenario. And it's usually more, the penalty they're charging you is more than the actual penalty you have. Um, so just to let you know. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, so I'm going to move on. Uh, thanks, Sam, for helping me manage this. Move on into the uh, the state issue. Um, and I think everybody finds this very funny. Um, and I think at this point in time, you might feel that because it's uh, it's uh, and we're about to go into another area that's just as much fun. Uh, and you'll have to bear with me. State income tax, just like the federal, uh, the Internal Revenue Code, they have some specific requirements. And here, you uh, state filing requirement. Basically, for this, <laughs> you get taxed. I don't know why we had a tea party. You get taxed uh, twice on the same income. The Fed will tax you and the state will tax you. Um, and um, um, so every U.S. citizen or resident alien will file a Fed return and a state return. More importantly, you might have come from another state at some time during the year. You might have two states, possibly three state returns to file for the one taxable year. Now, a lot of this turns on uh, uh, domicile. Uh, where's your intent to reside? And uh, to some degree, we can avoid double taxation. So there's there's a situation where you move uh, part year, you know, so you move from Virginia and you move to Michigan and you change your residency. Well, you have two returns, but only the first part to Virginia and then the second part to Michigan. You can also have where you come to Michigan as a non-resident. You keep your residency at your home state and you come to Michigan. Well, then you might have a return for your home state as well as Michigan. And you have to allocate between the two because you have uh, a residence uh, all year long in California, but you're spending a good portion of your time in Michigan and you have uh, two states wanting the same dollar to tax the same dollar. So that's usually how it works. And we'll talk about that as we go. Um, uh, and and the idea is to avoid double taxation as we go. And uh, so the first thing I want to do is walk you through a Michigan return. Um, it uh, The nice thing about it is, again, uh, there are certain states without a tax regime. So if you're from Florida, uh, Tennessee, uh, Texas for individuals, Nevada, they don't have tax rates, uh, tax return. I think Washington, they don't have an income tax. Um, that's very important because that means if you're moving to Michigan, you don't want to change your residency because you don't have to pay anything 
in your home state. And then all you pay to Michigan, just like the non-resident, is on the Michigan sourced income, not worldwide. And that's what you want to do. And we'll see examples of that. If you come from a state that has a higher tax rate than Michigan, you're going to want to change your residency to Michigan because we tax you at a lower rate. And if you stay with the state with the higher rate, you'll pay some state to, taxes to Michigan, but you'll pay the difference to your home state. And that's generally the rule. And the, the whole test turns on intent. Where do you intend to reside? And there's certain uh, primary source documents that the IRS is going to look at. And it's going to look at your driver's license, voter registration, your lease arrangement. You know, what proves to them where you are? You keep your driver's registration in California. Uh, you uh, have bank accounts in California. Um, you vote in California. You're going to look like you're a California resident. And you say you're a California resident, they're going to believe you. Problem is, California has a much higher tax bracket than Michigan. You're going to pay extra money to California during the time that you're in Michigan if you hadn't changed your domicile. Now, if you change your residency, it doesn't do anything for your NAFTA or anything like that. It's just for tax purposes, nothing else. So it doesn't make a statement for any other uh, regulation or any other kind of grant aid or anything like that. Um, you can also change back next year. It's not necessarily a problem. So now we're going to look at the Michigan state filing requirements. So if you're in Michigan, uh, you have to file a state return. What's interesting with Michigan is there's a homestead exemption. Uh, this is very important for a lot of the folks who, who file for this. Do keep in mind, uh, you have to be located in Michigan, but more importantly, you have to be a Michigan resident for at least six months. That's very important. Um, it, what's nice is it, it includes rent. Normally, you have to be a homeowner. Well, this is just renting because they, the state of Michigan believes that the price of the uh, taxes are in the rent. And if you own your own home, uh, then basically there's a tax value here. If it exceeds this, then you know, you're not going to get much. But that would be perfect for students who rent. You, know, you folks aren't renting the Taj Mahaj, so you're doing very well where you are and things are good. So here we are. Um, case study number one. You're a student, $8,025, non-qualified scholarships, uh, no other income, just flat here. You're not claimed as a dependent, again, a non-dependent, and you're a resident of Michigan, so you qualify for the homestead. Now, remember, we talked about credits and refundable credits, and this is going to come back to us. This is Jane Doe, and she's a resident. She has uh, um, $5,400 of an exemption, again, just for a standard deduction, just for breathing. The 8,000 less the 54 gives us 2625 at a 4.05% tax rate. It's a flat rate is $106, $106. And then we come down to the credit and it's 425. And when you finish the return, we get $319 back. You get money back from the state because you rented property as a homeowner. Oh no, as a, as a student in, 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 a, in an apartment building. That's good news. Um, Here's how the rest of the form works. A lot of it's based on what your rent is. It's based on what your income is, because if you're really wealthy, they're not going to give it to you. Um, they do certain percentage tests on it. Uh, so here it's 23%. You know, where they come up with these numbers is pretty interesting. But as you come by, they come up with a number and you subtract from 709, 257, you get 425. And that's what you bring back over here, the 425, and you subtract that from your tax. And the difference is the 319. Bottom line is it's a pretty squirrely way and a long-winded way of coming up with a non with a refundable credit. But basically the homestead exemption is a refundable credit, something to look into for students. That's the good news. That's the Michigan return. Now, if you're not a resident of Michigan, you have two choices. You can either be a part year resident in your home state and change your residency to Michigan, two returns, and one's completed, a tax return's completed with just the income that you earned while in that state. And then the rest of it's the Michigan return is just for the income you earned in Michigan. Um, or you keep your residency in your uh, um, home state and you now say you're uh, a non-resident while you're in Michigan. Um, now, the part year we won't go into as a case study because it's just it's just what it is. It's just cut in half. It's two returns. And then the next year you're a resident of Michigan. So you just file the one return. If you want to keep as a resident of your home state, you're going to file in Michigan this year and most likely next year and a couple of the years you're here as a non-resident. 
And again, that may work if you're in a, if you're from a home state that has a low or no tax jurisdiction for income taxes. Um, but if you if you're not aware of that, you can have an issue. That's what the case study will show here. Uh, we have a postdoc who's making fifty thousand dollars. Not bad. Now, the loss of interest. So it's fifty thousand seventy dollars goes on the return. They're from South Carolina and they uh, they don't claim uh, they're not claimed as a dependent by anyone else. Um, they have to file returns in Michigan and South Carolina. Clearly, if you're going to keep the Michigan as a non-resident, you have to, if you're a U.S. citizen or resident alien, you have to be a citizen of some state, in which case, and in this case, it's South Carolina. So you're going to have two returns. Now, you'll notice the rates. There's a graduated rate in South Carolina from three to 6.5, whereas Michigan, it's a flat four. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure which is better. He mentioned if it's a higher tax bracket, but how's it work? Well, I can tell you how this works. Same number. Well, in this case, you get your 5,400. Now you got $50,070. That's the total income you earn. You subtract out the 54. You also subtract out the $70. Remember now, you're only taxed on the Michigan earned income. That was the grant. The $70 goes to South Carolina because that was interest. They didn't earn that in Michigan. You earned that where your home state was. So you're only taxed on the 50,000 here in Michigan. And when you subtract out the 5,400, the tax on 4.05% um, on 44,600 is just over $1,800. That's all you got to pay. Not bad for $50,000. And you go, well, okay, but what do I owe for uh, South Carolina? Well, keep in mind, if you change the residency, it would be on $50,070. And 70 is the only thing you didn't get taxed on. So if you taxed the extra 70, on 4%, you're talking about another $3. So it'd have been like 1810 instead of 1806 or 1809, somewhere in there. So keep in mind, you sh should you have just changed your residency or not? We're going to find out. So here you go through the rest of the return, the 1806. That's what you end up with that you owe. Fine. It's not a problem. Now you're in Michigan. You've got to figure out if you're entitled to the full 5,400 and since so much income like 99 some percent of it is in Michigan, you get the full 5,400. And then there's the $70 that you get to deduct. So there's all these extra forms you have to fill out, but you're seeing how the breakout is. This is South Carolina for 70, and this is Michigan for 50. And you're only just 1,806 here, probably 1,810 if you brought it all into this column, but you didn't. You are loyal to South Carolina. This is the, uh, the here it is, you're single. And this is the uh, page one information form. Um, one, you're, you're one exemption. Uh, and here you are with the numbers. 50, 70, 50, 70. Look, you get to do, subtract out 46, 10. Now we were 5,400 in Michigan. So you're at 45, 460. You owe 2,239 on $70. Because you already paid on the 50,000 in Michigan. It just happened to be at a lower rate. So because the rate increased from 3% up to 6%, it's more, much more than our 4%, in which case you're going to pay a lot more. And basically, you're paying a total of 2239 Now, they give you the credit. You paid the 1806 so you don't have to pay an additional. You don't have to pay the full 2200 You subtract out the 1806 but you do have to pay $433 on $70 of interest. If you change your residency, You'd have saved, well, you would have paid an extra three, so you would have paid $430. So that's how it works on the state piece. And that's just something we want to show you so you're aware of that, uh, that, that financial advantage. Again, you know, changing your residency is a personal decision. It's up to you. And it is based on intent. Um, and you can do what you like. The Michigan website uh, is really particular about this, so you might want to read through it, but they're highly conservative. Part of it is there's a lot of students that this, these laws advantage, and they really don't like that. So there's a lot of issues there. Um, but I did just want to make sure you're aware of that. This is the last page with the publications we talked about. Um, this is probably the most helpful right here. Uh, and that's why I'm white and uh, the white block. And uh, very thorough here. These two are helpful to look at. They're all written by the IRS for the IRS, but just the same. I find them very helpful. So anyway, along those lines, at this point, Sam, I'm going to stop and ask for questions. Thanks, Ed. Okay, so our international students 
let's say in their first year here considered residents of Michigan? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, I think so. I think uh, uh, arguably uh, you're, uh, if I was a, uh, I don't even know if I'd have to file a state return theoretically because I'm a uh, non-resident. Um, but um, I am going to be taxed on my my Michigan sourced income here for sure. So in, in the example we just had, 50,000 of it, maybe not the 70, but the 50,000. If you're a non-resident alien, the state of Michigan doesn't have any more jurisdiction than the U.S. to tax your income that you earn in your home country because you're still a non-resident and the home country gets to decide how they want to tax you, you know, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. you will have to file a state return uh, as a non-resident alien, but you're not going to be taxed on your worldwide income, just on the income you earned while you were in Michigan. So someone who receives a 1042 as a resident alien yeah. um, is considered taxable Michigan state, uh, taxable towards the state of Michigan. Yeah, sure. Uh, both, fed, again, the Fed and state are going to tax you on the same dollar. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the Fed's going to tax you, and then you're going to have to fill out a state return as well. But it's just for the state of Michigan, and it's just the amount of the 1042S. It's not if you earned interest or had cap gain or rental income or anything else, that you earned out of the country or out of the state of Michigan, they don't have any access to it. So any jurisdiction to it. So. Okay. Thank you. If someone's parents are in another country and they support their tuition and they send their tuition as a gift to their bank account, do they report that for taxes? Yeah. So uh, gifts are not considered to be, there's a gift tax, but, um, and it's a very high standard. I think it even covers tuition. Um, and there is a, um, um, and there's no tax on loans. It's not income tax a loan because you're going to pay it back. There's no accretion of wealth. I got the money today, but tomorrow I got to pay it back. And with a gift, it comes from someone's generosity. Um, that's not anything I earned. And you know, although an accretion of wealth, it's considered to be a gift, uh, donative intent. And it, and there's not going to be any income tax on it, although there could be a gift tax to the gift. Okay. Thank you. So if someone is a U.S. citizen and they're moving abroad, is it possible to remain a non-resident of the state of Michigan? Um, so if you're a U.S. citizen, you are a U.S. citizen and, and you have a state that you are a citizen of um, and you can't relinquish that. So uh, and you'll be taxed on your worldwide income. So if you're from Michigan, born Michigan, bred and you go out of the country, you're still a Michigan citizen. Uh, just like you're a U.S. citizen and anything you make, if you sell the art in Ireland, you're going to have to pay tax to the U.S. on your income tax and to Michigan on that tax return. So you, if, I, if I'm answering the question correctly. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think so. <laughs> OK, OK. If someone's tuition fee is sponsored by a U.S. taxpayer whose visa status is H-1B, if they wanted to file this as part of their taxes, can a 1098 tax document be generated in their name? Uh, so run that by me again, please. It says, my tuition fee is sponsored by a U.S. taxpayer whose visa status H-1B. And they're asking if they want, if that person, the taxpayer who's sponsoring the tuition, yeah. wants to file as part of their taxes, can the 1098 form be generated in their name? Yeah, I don't think the 1098 T can, but keep in mind, it's not the T, it's the 8863 that you, you report on your tax return. So it would be whether you could take it on the 8863. And I'm thinking from a, a you know, the, how the law works, I'm not sure you get to take, uh, not sure how that works. I don't know if you get to take the, because is the um, there's a couple of po possible uh, obstacles here. Um, you know, parents can pay for someone's education, and uh, and it's a 1098T, and uh, the the T comes out to the student, but the parent can sit back and say, "Well, I paid for it," and so forth. But it really stays with the dependent. And if the parent claims it's a dependent, the parent gets it. So you see, it follows the dependency. And that's that that one test we went through. Um, but I don't know how that works with a, a foreign national, particularly if they're an NRA, because I don't know if that works. First, they have to be, I don't know how it works. So that would be, I haven't come across that before. So I'd have to check and see through that. But that may, that may work just the same and it may not. It depends. Part of it is 
the foreign nationals aren't entitled to the tuition deduction. The non-resident aliens aren't allowed to take it. You get the form. The only reason our non-resident aliens get the tax form is because our people in, in the student services don't want to have to go through the pile of 1098Ts and pull out the, their forms. Uh, but they're not entitled to it. So I don't because they're not entitled to it. I don't think the individual who's sponsoring would be entitled to it either, Sam. Um, okay. So that's the idea. That's my thought. But that's just, you know, I haven't I haven't researched that. But the the, the tenants of the, of the principles are out there. And I don't think that I don't think you can. Uh, um, I don't think you'll be able to get that. So that's my thought. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And do you pay quarterly taxes to the state or is it just federal? You can to the state. Yes. Uh, I will honestly tell you, I've never seen the state come back and say anything to anyone. I think they're just happy to get paid. Um, but if you're going to do it to the Fed, it's always nice to do it to the state. I can tell you, if you do it to the state on a regular basis, this, I find the state's completely different than the IRS. They're very personal. You get to know them. Uh, they'll help you. They'll walk you through things. And if they see that you're very compliant and diligent, they'll do they'll help you. I mean, they will actually help you make things go away, explain things to you and so forth. They're very helpful. It's very kind. They're very kind. And it's very nice. Wonderful. Are Roth or IRA contributions tax deductible? No. Um, but they, in, they what they do is because you didn't take a deduction for them going in, they accrue tax free the entire time. So when they come out, they're not taxed at all. Whereas with your traditional IRA, you take a deduction. It's a small amount. Uh, and whatever you deduct, that's got to come out when it comes out. It's got to be taxed. So that's the idea. So it's a front end, back end kind of thing. And Roth IRAs, uh, you know, it's it's one of those things where it's painful on the front end, but you really appreciate it on the back end because it's tax free. OK, so someone says that they're confused about Glacier software. They don't know the form that they need to fill out as an international student because they only see 1042 SW2, 1099 and others, but they don't find 8843 or 1040 NR among the options so software questions uh, obviously from my gray hair is clear that i will defer to someone pretty much at all times um but i think in this case the international operations center would probably be really helpful um they they work with it regularly i've not worked with glacier uh i i'm aware of it and i know the rules but at a very far high level and i don't really get the chance to work with the software so i apologize no need for apologies ed you're more than knowledgeable if someone does the money that they make from fellowship count towards the total household resources for the michigan homestead tax uh -huh. good question um so again uh yeah i i think you want to want to look at that closely um i think that uh, when we looked at it it's a much broader definition you look on the web for the irs they'll have a or i'm sorry for the state of michigan they have a pretty good uh handle on that and they talk about it i don't believe they talk about fellowships directly but they'll give you a feel for the fact that it 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 should be included. But my sense is read through it. I don't want to. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm certainly open to any interpretations you have. Let's put it that way. So uh, they're not very clear about it. Well, they are to some degree. They're not that clear. And a lot of clever people out there can take a position, which uh, is why we have court cases. Right. So I leave I leave that to you. How do we treat the tax treaty on 1040 since they know that even resident aliens still applies the U.S.-China tax treaty for $5,000 following the tax treaty article 20C. Yeah, um, that's a pretty specific question. I'd probably have to pull up the treaty to read that. So, okay. yeah, sorry. And we have a hand raised. Shag, hi. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, do you have my voice? Yes. I can hear um, you. I'm sorry. I wanted to uh, ask about uh, the state tax. Uh, I am a first year international student with F1 visa and we do not pay taxes in my country. So I kind of was not sure uh, if I should pay anything uh, except the federal tax or not. Uh, cause I I can see something called W four, uh, form on my profile, for the uh state tax. Um, can you can you help me with that a little? 
So is it a W-2 or W-4? I have W-2, but I also can see something called W-4. Yeah. A W-4 is typically something that you don't, we don't share with the IRS, IRS doesn't share with us. That's usually between you and your employer. And you tell your employer, here's how much I want to withhold or something like that. Um, the W-2 is the tax form that we share with the IRS. And at the very bottom of that, uh, throughout most of it's Fed tax, at the very bottom, it says state and city local taxes. So uh, the W-2 is probably more helpful. Do they have anything in the state column for W-2 at the very bottom? Um, I'm not. Uh, maybe I should check again, but like, so uh, if I have understood uh, correctly, I do not have to pay state tax. So my thought is, if you're a non-resident alien, you're going to want to pay your Fed tax and your state tax on your U.S. sourced income. And the state taxes would be Michigan if you were in Michigan when you got your scholarship, the taxable piece of the scholarship. If it's not taxable, you don't owe anybody anything. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you so much. Good. Um, as someone asks, that says that they're an F one visa student and they don't have any U.S. income, do they still have to file their taxes using the eighty eight sixty three form? So the uh, eighty eight sixty three, if I remember correctly, that is a form that we file that says I'm providing personal service or services in in the U.S. and um, um, whether it should or shouldn't be subject to a, a taxation because of my treaty. Uh, and that's something that you're really going to want to talk to payroll about because that's who the form is filed with. It's not filed with the IRS. It's filed with our payroll office. And they determine how they want to uh, classify, the, classify the income and then treat it if it's taxable. So my sense is anything with the 8863 would probably go through. Uh, uh, vendors do the W-8 B, Benny and other things like that. But uh, 8862 is an old form that we use for non-resident alien individuals, particularly providing working here at the university. So my sense is, yeah, I would talk to payroll about that because they're going to have your information right in front of you and they can answer a lot of questions right there for you. Thanks, Ed. Okay, two more questions. Do you have any helpful software or resources for filing state taxes? That's a great question. So I think the best resource is each other. I mean, a lot of you have the same situation and uh, you talk to somebody and say, how are you doing it? And they say, here's where I'm coming up. And you say, did you pay quarterly estimated taxes? Yes. How much? You know, they tell you, you go, I'm not paying any of that. Why? Here's why. And maybe one's married and maybe one's not, you know, and so forth. But the idea is you get a feel from each other. That's the best way to correct yourself. Uh, check on yourself, see what's going on with what, you know, reviewing your own information. But, you know, I found too, you just wake up one morning, go to Barnes and Noble, sit down at that you know, pull up a master tax guide, grab a coffee and just read through some of that stuff. And uh, the way about taxes, it's a ripple effect. So the first time you read it, you go, I don't think I get this. And then you read it again, you go, I think I, I, think I understand a little more. And by the third time, you're there. And it, and that's why when you run into somebody you know and you talk to them, you're, you're picking it up again. That's another ripple. So the idea is it's very helpful uh, to socialize what you can uh, with people you trust, because a lot of this is confidential information and I appreciate that. But um, we use a... Uh, 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 there's a couple of softwares. Um, um, uh, boy, there's a couple of them. I think I'm thinking of, um, and, and they're they're all pretty reasonable. And you know, um, I think that they're pretty good with scholarships too at this point in time. So if you're doing your 1098T and box five is greater than one, they'll put the amount on your taxable income is taxable income or on page one of your tax return is taxable income. And you then have to figure out if that's correct or not. So they're all they're all very good about um, um, doing what they uh, being able to do that for you. So the, the softwares are pretty good. So I can't complain. I'm sorry. Turn this down. So the softwares are actually pretty good. So I'm not having a problem with that. So um, but I leave that up to you as to how you want to do it. I know there's a. Uh, um, everybody has their own way and everybody has their own. I don't want to prejudice HR block. I think we've seen that and a couple other things. I don't want to push one over the other, but my sense is feel free to, um, to grab anything like that, but that that's probably, and talking to each other, I think is one of the good ways to go about it. So yeah, that really works out well. I'm sorry. Okay. And, and actually someone asked the value that you get when you subtract box five from box one on a 1098 T for yeah. your case study number one, the 14 
$1,250 income. Is that that value? So if I were to do that, that would be in box five. And then let's say in box one, tuition was 10,000 and the 1485 was stipend. Then the four, box five would be the 2485 because it'd be the tuition and the stipend. Do you see what I mean? Box five is qualified and non-qualified scholarships. Box one is just qualified scholarships. And that's why box five, if you got the full amount paid, will exceed box one because it includes both the qualified and non-qualified where box one can only include qualified. And that's really the formula for what's taxable, right? The qualified is taxable and the, and, and the non-qualified is taxable and the qualified is non-taxable. So um, it, that, it does that math for you. It just does it indirectly in the sense that my sense is the IRS doesn't necessarily audit from that. So that's the idea. But did I answer that question? Yes. Um, and Xi Jin, this will be our last question because we are over time and I don't want to take up anybody else's time. Yeah. Especially yours, Ed. <laughs> okay, so that means I can speak, right? Sure. Okay, so I only have a little bit question more. So um, the first thing is that uh, do we need to pay the FIC a test for residence alien? Because we are still the uh, still the full time student here, um, I checked the international center website and it says even uh, if you're getting four credits or more, then you don't need to pay that tax. Yeah, so I think they're referring to the FICA tax. So there's the two taxes: income tax, and then mm. there's FICA. Uh, the mm. income is on your accretion of wealth, and the FICA is on your earned income, and if you're a GSRA or uh, G, uh, GSI or any anybody along those lines, um, you're basically going to be enrolled for more than half time. And if that's the case, any money you're earning will be subject to income tax, but it won't be subject to FICA because it'll meet the student exception. And a student is defined as somebody who's enrolled for more than half time. Um, so the good news is you won't have to pay FICA tax, but you're going to have income tax on whatever they're paying you, the stipend, the cash stipend. Yeah. Okay. So another another question is that we don't need to include any like a gift money or something from the yeah. because I I think you mentioned before because I checked the website as it says if you're received a gift after you become the resident alien and more than like a one hundred thousand dollars then you need to report using like a form three three two five or something. So. It won't be taxed, but you have to report it. So, um, well, I'm not familiar with the three three two five. Looking at it from a tax perspective, if someone gives you a gift, um, it's code section one hundred two will tell you. I'm sorry to throw out code section, but let you know it's there. Uh, says that gifts are excluded. Uh, now, um, you know they. Now, for instance, when you win the Olympic gold, that can be taxable because you earned it. But if someone gave you something and they give you the twenty twenty thousand dollars for tuition that's not going to be taxable income to you uh it's all within the same family unit it was given with disinterested generosity sometimes more than disinterested generosity but it's yours and it's to a gift so it's not going to be taxable income um okay. that's trust me now they the person who gave it to you doesn't get a deduction for it so um but yeah you're allowed to transfer money back and forth particularly among family members it happens all the time and it's not considered to be a taxable event. So it's a, it's a very good question. Okay. And the last question, as I think I haven't mentioned before, is like about the U.S.-China Tax Treaty 20C. I already find the documents that we need. So, um, and as I know that because I checked the website, it says we only need to like uh, directly subject, uh, subtract from the, uh, the one A part income directly from our W two um gross wages there. So because we we do got like a five thousand dollars for the tax treaty, even even though for example I'm the resident alien right now, but it still works for for me. So so I just yeah because before I fill out the one zero four zero NR and they do have I do have a form to put the tax treaty in, in the box, but here I don't have this form to put the box. So I just want to know if I need to fill up the like 8863, the form to plan that kind of thing or what else I need to do. So 
Yeah. So it was, if it's a software question, I, I promise you, I can't help you. Um, I've it's not, not a thought... software question. It's just the form. What kind of form I should be used or where I need to put that like a minus $5,000 to get the deduction. Yeah. So, but that sounds, but I don't know if you need to put that. I don't know how you report that on. So I see what you're saying. It's, uh, I imagine the exception you're talking about, you're talking about article 20. Is that what it is? Students and yeah, trainees? Yeah, it's 20C. Yeah. I ever put in the chat two images there. Yeah. Income from personal services performed in that contracting state in amount of not in excess of 5,000 US dollars or it's equivalent in Chinese one for any taxable year. Um, yep, another, I, yeah. There was another image that shows why the residents aliens to apply for that. So, yeah. So my sense is, you do whatever, how are you don't, I don't think there, I'm not necessarily sure there is a form because all you have to do, just like the one scenario we had, the case study, when you put on what's the return, you just put on what the taxable income is. And, okay. Um, and if it's a situation where um, payroll is putting it on a 1042S, they're not going to look at the treaty. So you need to talk to payroll and say, 20C says the first five grand comes off. And then either that's it's written that way and read that way, or it's it's a threshold trust, meaning, meaning once you exceed the 30, you don't get any of it. Do you see what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. I don't, and, and it says uh, it should be exempt from tax with respect to income from personal services. So it, it may be a threshold question. It may be a um, a, um, a subtraction question. So uh, if you got 6,000, it's only 1,000. And but that would yeah, be yeah. when they go to report it be on the 1040 to West, they're going to report the taxable income. And that's where you bring in the treaty 20 C 20 C to explain to them the 5000 should come off of the 6000 and leave you with one. So it's a math that goes on a form. It probably would go on the 1040 to West as I see it. Uh, if it's something we're paying you and you want that amount taken out, the 8633 you're talking about um, is a personal services form that you're doing for the University of Michigan. And that helps them, that helps them identify the 5,000. That or you can call them and tell them, but either way, it's going to go on the 1042 S. So you want to talk, if you get the S and they haven't in, in, taken it into consideration, you call payroll and ask them, here's what happened. Can you do this? And they may say, oh, you got to fill out the 8633 and you go, fine, give it to me. I'll do it. And you can do it. But it's the 1042S, I think that's the, the main generator of this because that's the reporting, the form used to report your taxable income. Okay, so I just need to just show show that on the 1040. So that, that's it for now. And also including the 8863 8, form for the, for the claim that why I'm suitable for this $5,000 deduction, right? Yeah, so, but then again, if you're going to do it, and you have to ask, is it a 1040 or 1040 NR? And if it's an NR, International Operations Center has that software, and they have no, people. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm already the resident's alien, so I'm using the 1040. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, does the treaty apply? Right. So your residents. Uh, I think it's replied because I checked a lot from the website about this kind of thing. So. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Ed, we thank you greatly. You have given us so much information, so much knowledge, so much to take home and to apply to our very fast approaching tax deadline. Um, thank you all for being here. <sighs> the recording will be processed within a few weeks and it will be sent to you along with Ed's slides. Again, although Ed's slides should be in the in your inbox. You can